Toronto family wants to know why Toronto police used a kill shot on their brother who is experiencing a crisis. Montreal's fire department lifts a moratorium on inspections to ensure fire safety in apartments after the deadly fire in the city's old port. First Nations women are 11 times more likely to die from toxic drugs than other women in the province of British Columbia. And Stellantis and LG do extortion, but Canadian media report on it as if it's just a tiff between companies and the government. Good morning. It's Tuesday, May 16th. I'm Nora, and here are your headlines. First, we go to Toronto, where Toronto police shot and killed Andrew Geisler last week. Yesterday, his sister spoke to Global News' Amir Khan, asking why he was killed with just two shots and not subdued in a way that could have kept him alive. The SIU is investigating the incident. People called police when they saw Andrew acting erratically and wielding a knife in a shopping plaza in Scarborough. Witnesses said that police told him to drop his knife, and when he didn't, they shot him dead. They used just two shots to kill him. His sister said that there isn't enough help available for people who are experiencing addiction like her brother was, and she wants police to stop aiming for the head or the abdomen when they are interacting with someone in crisis. Next, to Quebec, where the Globe and Mail has obtained a document that shows that Montreal's fire department had a moratorium on inspecting evacuation routes in apartment buildings. The moratorium started in October 2018, and they've quietly ended it since seven people were killed in a fire in Montreal's Old Port in a building that many have said would not have met fire code obligations for fire exits. Through two anonymous sources, the Globe reports that the moratorium stopped fire officials from enforcing safety standards. Non-compliant evacuation routes that had been flagged by inspectors at the time the memo was written were automatically given a one-year grace period. Gosh, you really think about the people who lived in these places where the fire department was saying, yeah, don't worry about it, you can fix it in a year, maybe, if we follow up, which we won't. The Globe reports, quote, the memo says management made the decision because of a lack of staff training. It also cites a lack of defined indicators for compliance with regulations and other issues. The fire department referred questions about this and other matters to the city of Montreal, which declined to answer, unquote. In the building where seven people died and nine were injured from a fire, dead end hallways and a lack of exits have been identified as early as 2009. The Globe couldn't find evidence that these issues were ever fixed. Issues were also flagged in 2018. No second exit on the third floor and a dead-end hallway on the second. A review of the apartment building was requested and granted, but was denied in 2021. The building also had an insufficient fire alarm system and, quote, several subsequent interventions with the building's owner, unquote. The owner of the building is Emilheim Benamor, and comments from him have been directed to his lawyer. His lawyer's not commenting because there's a public inquiry announced that will look into the disaster. In case you're wondering if your city and fire department will come to your rescue if you're living under the thumb of a slumlord, I guess here's your answer. Now to British Columbia, where the First Nations Health Authority has found that First Nations women are 11 times more likely to die from toxic drugs than other women in the province. Of the 373 First Nations people that have died from drug poisoning in 2022, a third were women. That's compared to the overall percentage of women who died from drug poisoning, which is a sixth of the total amount. There are a lot of structural reasons for why First Nations women are dying at such high rates. One example in the article in the Vancouver Sun lists harm reduction measures that aren't meant to make Indigenous women feel safe, sometimes pushes them away. And fears of losing custody of their children can keep women away from accessing services that can help them withdraw. These services usually require that women spend time away from their kids, and so it places many mothers in impossible situations. Since 2016, more than 12,000 people in British Columbia alone have died from toxic drugs. And finally, Stellantis, the company that owns Chrysler Fiat and LG Energy Solutions, is trying its hand at extortion, though Canadian journalists are mostly accepting the premise and are calling it a battle or, in the case of the Global Mail, a standoff or a bind. 
Stellantis and LG were supposed to build the first ever electric vehicle battery plant in Canada, but they're pissed that Canada offered Volkswagen the ridiculous sum of $13 billion to build its EV battery plant in St. Thomas, Ontario. Naturally, this news made Stellantis and LG stop the construction of its $5 billion plant in Windsor. Stellantis and LG have announced that they will move their facility, unless, that is, the feds give them more money. Now, Trudeau and Ford did promise Stellantis and LG money, a billion dollars to subsidize the construction of this plant in Windsor, which, by the way, is a hell of a lot of money. But Stellantis and LG want more. They want the amount to be upped to be comparable to the $13 billion that the feds promised Volkswagen. See what I'm saying? It's extortion. This report, penned by Adam Redwanski and Laura Stone at the Globe and Mail, said that the federal government, quote, has expressed openness to increasing the subsidies, unquote, and that Freeland, quote, signaled optimism about resolving the current dispute, unquote. Pause here. Expressed openness, signaled optimism. Who writes like this? These are meaningless phrases that could have been written by the government itself. They aren't even in quotes. Why are these reporters writing like this? My God. Anyway, most of the article focuses on something called the Inflation Reduction Act, an American act that has defined the amount of money the the U.S. government has been putting into auto subsidies. It's the justification and defense for why Canada needs to and has decided to spend so much money to attract Volkswagen to come to Canada. It's all the U.S.'s fault. If Canada wants to compete with the U.S., then we're going to have to fork over the money that the U.S. can fork over, which is ridiculous considering the size difference between our economies. That, of course, isn't really interrogated in the article. The Inflation Reduction Act is just given as background that has set the stage for such a difficult negotiation between Stellantis and LG and the federal government. But the Ontario government is also involved in this. The pair quoted an anonymous source who said that Ottawa will have to negotiate with Ontario to get them to up their subsidy. It's not clear why the source was granted anonymity to say something so obvious. Of course, they're going to have to do this. The subsidy that went to Stellantis and LG in the first place is a joint subsidy between the federal government and the provincial government. But it adds to the framing of this as it's so complicated and there's so many different players in here that it's just going to be so difficult for Canada to do anything other than up their subsidy amount for Stellantis and LG, lest we lose all of the jobs that have been promised with this factory. The pair also massaged the narrative with a little bit of editorialization. Here's one quote. Despite the seemingly unwieldy dynamics of two levels of government struggling to get on the same page to avoid losing a pivotal clean economy investment, auto industry veterans said such haggling is common, though it is usually conducted behind closed doors, unquote. As if to remind readers that federal provincial matters are extremely complicated and quote unquote unwieldy, making us forget, I guess, that these two levels of government already came up with the first amount in the first place that they promised to Stellantis and LG. The whole thing is happening because of provincial federal negotiations. So why would they break down now? Anyway, the article ends with a quote from an auto industry analyst who said that these kinds of negotiations are normal, though they don't usually happen so publicly. But then the article ends with this head scratcher of a quote. I've never seen brinkmanship of this sort, said Greg Mordew, a former auto sector executive who chairs Advanced Manufacturing Policy at McMaster University's engineering school. Quote, so I would assume that it's not brinkmanship. (laughs) I mean, sorry, what does that even mean? It's not brinkmanship because Mordew has never seen brinkmanship of this sort. And it's not brinkmanship because he's never seen it. Like, it's so useless. I don't understand why this was tacked on to the end of the article. It's as if the journalists just want to make sure that we know that they talked to several auto industry analysts and that Mordew just has to be in this article for some reason. Anyway. There's no mention in the article of just how much money a billion dollars or $13 billion is in terms of nurses or teachers or new roads or boosts to disability supports. Readers are just supposed to accept that extortion is normal and really just a part of how business goes. There's not much reminder that this is our money, but the globe knows who they work for. So why would they remind us of that? That's all for Tuesday, May 15th. 
I'm Nora, and usually today is Sandy and Nora Day, but we're off for a couple of weeks while Sandy's doing some pretty cool stuff. So I will drop an episode of one of my other podcasts into the feed today. I hope you enjoy it. 